home, I think, already, haven't we? So what, what I'm going to hopefully do, um, and it's living dangerously, as always, a live demo, but we'll, we'll see if, uh, if we get around to that or not. But I've got some, some pictures of uh, screenshots as a, as a fallback and safety measure. So adding federated identity management to OpenStack, this is a project that we started in May this year. Uh, prior to this, we actually added federated uh, identity management to Eucalyptus. Um, and, uh, and we gave a demonstration of that last year to, at a cloud conference. Why do it? Okay. I guess you're all converted here, so I probably don't need to go through this slide. But, but here's some reasons. It makes it easier for users. They have less credentials to manage and remember because if they've got one lot of credentials and they can single sign on to lots of different services, it makes it easier for them. It makes it easier for system developers because you don't need to develop the secure authentication mechanisms in your application because you can trust an already established secure identity provider to do it for you. So it makes the system developer's job easier. Provides more flexibility because the identity provider can have lots of different uh, authentication mechanisms. It's out of scope of the federated domain, how it works. So it can be two-factor, three-factor. It can be biometrics, whatever. Um, and uh, all we require in the federation domain is uh, some assurance of the level that's been, that's been authenticated. And we can then build that into our subsequent authorization mechanism. And it can actually be more secure than doing it yourself because the users now can have one set of strong credentials uh, rather than lots of passwords that they replicate or you know, use simple passwords so they can remember them all. Um, and you're no longer a honeypot for credential attacks yourself because you're not storing any. So they're not going to be attacking you to try and get all these credentials out. And you only need to look on the, the internet and find how many of the service providers have had their credentials stolen and credit cards stolen, passwords and everything like that. And it makes it a lot easier for operations staff because you no longer have to manage users. You don't have to register users. You don't have to replace their forgotten passwords or their forgotten credentials when they're stolen. Uh, you don't have to remove old users because that's done by the identity provider uh, for you. But there are some limitations, OK? Because you still need a way to finally differentiate users for authorization purposes. So if, you, if you've got a federated domain uh, and there are a 1,000 users, or say let's, let's say you're federated with the University of Kent, um, well, you've instantly got 20,000 potential users coming into your, into your system, and you say, well, actually, I don't want 20,000. I only actually want three academics that I'm working with. So you still have to have some mechanism to differentiate between the three people from Kent that you do want and the 20,000 that actually can authenticate you successfully. So you still need to have the fine-grained authorization. Uh, you still need to be able to ban abusive users as well, and if the identity provider is actually authenticating them, you've either got to then change your authorization system to ban them or ask him to, 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 to ban them. You probably need to use a web browser. This is one of the limitations at the moment because most of the current existing identity providers, the, the, the authentication step is all via browsers. So we've had to build in the browser uh, in our implementation because, yeah. Sorry? Um, pass. Okay, I, I mean, we, you, we looked at, can we should do command line and should we actually modify command line interface, but it becomes too complicated, actually. Um, the reason being because identity providers, they all present different screens to the user. So if you're going to actually parse the HTTP message and find out, now where's, where in this post uh, or whatever, where's the actual username field and where's the password field and what do I need to put in, it becomes really, really difficult. Whereas a user... He's got intelligence, and he can see the screen, and he can know exactly what to put in which field. And, and yeah? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so what browser do you think is the best? How would this work? Like, who, why, 
Well, you, 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 say, you say the web browser is the third class client, but I, I hypothesize it might become the first class client because once you start to roll out uh, to everyday users, they're not going to want to use the command line interface that we're using today. Okay, you, you, uh, yeah? They're, uh, they're, they're, they're not. I mean, I mean we, we, we've, got, we've got students who are, who are building, you know, for Cisco, they're building browser clients for OpenStack because they don't believe that people, your everyday users will use these command line interfaces. So, you know, I think the browser may very well become the first class citizen what in the future. Well, in, in, f in fact, actually, the ones that, that where you do use a browser, if you read the specs, they don't require right. a browser, okay? It's just that the current implementations... So still working on the reality. Yeah, so that's the reality. That's why I'm saying probably need to use one for the actual step at the, at the moment, okay? Um, and there are more steps involved in the, in the protocols and the user interface, so it actually slows things down, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the user has more things to do. It just doesn't entry his username and password on the individual command line, but there are other things he has to do. Um, and most identity management systems are open to phishing attacks. So this is, a big, this is a big negative. The fact that if you, as a user, go get tricked into going to the wrong service provider through spam or spear phishing or whatever, and that web service provider says, hey, I've got free gifts for you. All you need to do is authenticate um, and choose your identity provider. And you say, well, University of Kent. And it redirects you to a page that looks just like the University of Kent's page, but it's actually a fraudulent page. And then you type in your username and password, and bang, you're dead in the water because you've now lost your credentials. And they're, they're, all, they're all the ones today, they're all really vulnerable to that phishing attack. So, uh, it, it, yes, but what I'm saying is it's the reality of the systems today. It's the reality is they are vulnerable to that. Now, to get around it, if you have a zero knowledge proof authentication mechanism by the IDP, then it doesn't matter if you get tricked into going to a false IDP that looks like yours because when you give them the authentication, you're giving them zero knowledge, so it doesn't matter. So if, you, if, if the IDP is using, say, PKI for authenticating its user, it doesn't really matter because you're not going to tell them anything. You're not going to send them your private key. You're going to send them something signed. And so zero knowledge proof will solve that, okay? Um, or you can have an intelligent client that doesn't require redirection, and it knows itself where to go to. So the work we've been doing in our lab is to build intelligent intelligence into the client. So when the service provider says you need to authenticate, you and your intelligent client say, I'm going to go here, and, you, and he doesn't redirect you. The service provider does not redirect you. And, and that's another way to, to solve it. OK, so look, all, the all the components that we've got in our system, the green ones are really what today is Keystone. But I've not called it Keystone. Um, even though it is Keystone, it's really Keystone broken down into its fundamental components, into its functional components. Um, and I've called it the OpenStack gateway, okay? Just so that you think, well, that's Keystone. Well, it is, but it isn't. So think of it as an OpenStack gateway. Uh, what do all these acronyms stand for? Well, at the bottom, we've got the token issuing service and the token validation service. So that's the one that issues the token, either a scope token or unscope token, and the validation service is the one that validates the scope token or the, un, or the um, unscope token. And by making those separate components, it means you can actually plug and play uh, and put in different token issuing services. So your can token can be in different format. I mean, we've already got, we were talking today about having two different token formats, one based on SMIME and PKI, another one based on simple, simple UUIDs. Well, having this as clearly defined with interfaces, separate, you, separate tokens, you can actually plug and play and, and put in different, different uh, services there. Um, AM is the attribute mapping service. Why do we need an attribute mapping service? Well, down at the bottom, we have all our cloud services. 
And those cloud services are role-based, and they have roles that give permissions to perform particular actions. Now, those cloud services will have a limited set of roles. They might have an admin role. They might have, we are talking today about a teacher role and a, and, uh, and a student role and, uh, and, and various roles. Like that. But it will be a limited set of roles that they have. Now, in the big outside federated world, there's gonna, there are literally hundreds of thousands of identity providers and maybe thousands or millions of attributes. And it would be unreasonable to expect service providers to understand all the identity providers and all their attributes and to build their policies according to the outside world. So they build their policies according to their own local set of roles. And the attribute mapping service is capable of mapping between what the outside world provides in terms of identity, identity attributes and what the local cloud service requires. And it can do them the mapping. We'll see how it works when we go through the, uh, the swim lane diagrams. So that, that functionality really takes some attributes from the outside world and maps them into uh, the attributes that are required for the inside world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so in, 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 in today's Keystone, Keystone is the identity provider and Keystone issues the attributes for the user. And so the attributes it issues for the user are already the ones that the cloud provider wants. So what we have to have now is a mapping step that when we introduce federation, we get in a whole different bunch of attributes and we map them into the ones that you're issuing today. And we still issue them today. Because in this model, as you'll see, the cloud service provider sends the user to the OpenStack gateway and it tells the OpenStack gateway what it wants in terms of attributes, which are the ones it wants today. And that could be hard-coded in, or it could be dynamically sent in protocol. That's a, that's a choice. Yeah? So maybe that's simplifying the fact that the federated Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Federated authorization. Well, the thing is, it, it ask the question, what is identity management? Then you ask the simple, more simple question, well, what is identity? And identity is a set of attributes, basically. Your identity is a set of attributes, okay? No, no, no. In, in, in a generic sense, identity is a set of attributes. So if, 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 if I want to identify you, I'll say, well, it's the guy who used to work for Microsoft. He developed Passport. Uh, he's now got his own company. He's uh, aged about 40, and he's of Asian, uh, and he wears glasses, right? No, 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 but the point is that is your, that's your, ident that identifies you within the audience, yeah? Um, and, but it, it might be, the identity might be an employee of, of uh, Rackspace. I might have a system which says any employee of Rackspace gets access. So in terms of identity management, all I need is to know you're an employee of Rackspace, and that can be sufficient, okay? So in, gen in general, an identity is a, is a set of attributes. Now, attributes have to come from somewhere. I mean, we're, we're going into a different lecture now. We're going into a lecture on uh, identity management, which I didn't want to go into, but, but attributes have to come from somewhere. You do not generally trust a user to assert his own attributes, because if you did, and I know that Rackspace has got some really nice juicy service there, and all you need to do is say you're a member of an employee of Rackspace to get access, then I'll go and say, oh, I'm an employee of Rackspace. They'll say, oh, welcome, come on in and have access to our nice juicy service. So clearly you can't allow the user to assert his own identity attributes. You have to have attribute authorities. And so up here, we've got attribute authorities. And attribute authorities assert attributes. And also, we've got authentication services which can authenticate users, but don't assert attributes. They will just assert some random I identifier. And an identity provider is actually a combination of an authentication service and an attribute authority. So functionally, an identity, provi identity provider is both an authentication service 
and an attribute authority. So it's capable of authenticating the user and returning a set of identity attributes about the user. Now, where most identity management models are flawed today, and why a lot of them have failed, is they assume that the user has one identity provider and all his attributes are asserted by that one identity provider. And in the general case, that is fallacious. So if I, if I want to go and purchase something from Amazon, I have to provide a credit card, okay? Now, who's gonna assert that I've got a credit card? The bank, right? I also may want to assert a name. Uh, who's gonna assert my name? Well, the bank might, but I might assert my own name. If I'm buying from Amazon, I might want to assert a postal address where it's to be delivered to, so they would probably allow me to assert that. They may give a discount to academics. Who are they gonna trust to say I'm academic? The University of Kent. Okay, they're not going to trust the bank, they're not going to trust me. So you see, in, in a generic infrastructure, we need, ultimately, to get assertions from multiple authorities. And so what we're building in, in the more sophisticated swim lanes, which I'm not going to cover today because we don't have time, it will be the al amalgamation of attributes from different authorities. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> No, 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 but, 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 but the trainline.com does. So if you go to the trainline.com and buy train tickets, you can say you're a student and you'll get a discount on your ticket. And you can actually say you're over 60 years old and you'll get a discount on your ticket as well. Well, inter interesting what happens there, because, because you have to physically turn up and travel on the train, the, un the internet will sell you the reduced price ticket and then the ticket inspector, when you're traveling, he'll say, can I see your student ID card now, please? Or can I see your old age pensioner card, please? And if you haven't got it, then you're in stuck because you've cheated the system and then you'll get fined. Um, so it, it will sell it you without, an assert without the assertion. But that's because online, they have no way today of actually getting that assertion other than you telling them. Okay, but, but we, we emphasize a world where they will be able to get genuine assertion. They wouldn't sell you the ticket without, without the assertion. That's, that's an aside. So back, back to these components. We've been through those components. The next one is the request issuing service. So if we're going to be doing identity uh, management and federated management, we have to have a protocol conversation between the client and the identity provider. It has to authenticate and it has to send an assertion back here to say that um, this, this user has been authenticated. Now, there are many different protocols for identity management. And so what we want to build into OpenStack is a generic infrastructure that will support OpenID, that will support SAML, that will support OAuth, et cetera. And therefore we say, let's have a separate module which is a request issuing service and you will configure into that what protocol you're going to talk between the OpenStack gateway and the identity provider and then the request issuing service will produce the request in the right protocol. So that if that module is pluggable and switchable, you can actually then plug your system into different identity federations. Two questions. Yeah. Two issuing service. Issuing service. Uh, is that the no, 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 it's asking, it's asking for the identity attributes of okay. the user. Okay, okay. so it, it, it wants the user to be authenticated and get the attributes of the user. Sorry? Um, well, it, um, no, 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 that, that, that is something you don't have in Keystone today. The, the, yeah, the client, the client manufactures, in other words, there's an implicit knowledge of what the protocol is between the client and Keystone, and the client manufactures a HTTP message using the implicit knowledge of what Keystone requires, and it sends it to Keystone, okay? What you do have today is the credential validation service, which is the component in the pipeline which takes that request and validates it and says whether it's right or not. So, Yeah. Well, yeah, 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 but the, 
Yeah, today, today the request issuing service is done by the client that creates it and sends it to Keystone, and then Keystone passes it in the pipeline to the credential validation service and says, validate this, is it okay or not? Yeah, 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 it could, it could. So, so um, that, that component could actually be a standalone, or it could be a library. It could be a library that you plug into Keystone and you plug into clients and you, yeah, okay. But I've, I've drawn it out because I see it as being a separate modular piece of functionality that is specific to the identity management protocol you're using and therefore we want to be plugged and replaced as you move from SAML to OAuth or, or whatever. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, because if you've got a dumb client, if you've got a dumb client, the client cannot manufacture that that message. So, so talking about the client, we've got the client which is a dumb client and doesn't do anything. <laughs> um, it just gets messages in, passes them back, and gets answers and passes them back. So. The dumb client is given the message by the request issuing service, which it passes on to the IDP. It then authenticates the user, uh, and then it gets a response from the IDP. It's got no idea what that response is. It's just some binary blob, which it gives over to the gateway, and the gateway gives it the credential validation service, and that says, okay, is this the, the blob that I'm expecting? So you, you replace those two components. Oops. You replace those two components as a pair, because they have to, to match up with each other. Now, a tag, I think something's gone wrong here. Okay, uh, a tag is a, a, an intelligent component that builds into the cl client, <coughs> which, which does several, performs several important pieces of functionality. One is it allows um, the client not to be fished, for um, it will actually determine itself where the identity provider is by contacting the directory service. Well, attribute aggregation. Because attribute aggregation, because it also is capable of going to multiple attribute authorities and getting assertions from multiple places and aggregating them together and giving them to Keystone. <coughs> so that's the attack. And it also Sorry, could you use the microphone? I didn't quite, qu quite, quite get that. Sometimes you don't need all the attributes, right? Like you might just want to know your credit card information, but we don't need your age or your national. Correct, correct, something. correct. So there's like a lazy mode of collecting attributes on a need-based. Correct, way. correct. So, so what I've got built into the model is policy, um, which will come when we see the swim lanes. So, each of these has a policy for what it wants. And so that policy is given to the OpenStack gateway and said, that's my policy for what I want. The OpenStack gateway uses the attribute mapper to convert the policy from the local terms, such as the admin and whatever, into the terms that are required by the remote IDP, um, and then to do the reverse mapping. So the, the client and the IDP, or ATAG, are only told what's wanted by the particular service provider. So you don't go collecting every single attribute you've got and giving your entire I identity out. You just give the three or four attributes that are required by the service. So that's built into the, the design that the... the Well, it's not the lazy fashion, actually. No, the lazy fashion that was, was described as being just grab everything you can and just send everything you can. No, this no, no, that wasn't the oh, wasn't it? That oh. was the eager fashion. That was the what? Eager. Eager. Oh, okay. All oh, right. Well, this, 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 this supports the, 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 the lazy. I, I mean, I, I think that's the wrong term, lazy. I would have said, I would have said privacy, privacy, privacy preserving fashion, if you like, uh, um, where you only actually release the attributes that are required to access the service. You don't give them superfluous information. 
Okay, and, and then, oops, sorry. Provider one decides. Pro provider one has a policy for, provider, the policy's here, okay, the policy's here. Um, it's been externalized, but it could be internal, it doesn't matter. The point is, the cloud service provider has some interface, which we were talking about earlier on today, an interface to call the policy decision point to say, here's a user, does he get access or not? Now, it knows what its policy is, and it knows what it requires from the user. So we call, we call the policy it gives an attributes requirements policy. So, No, no, no. Now, listen. I decide whether I want a user or not. Right. Correct. Now, so, so, so yeah. So I think it's clear that so it's a unique way of asking a, a, a service, what do I need to provide you? And then the user needs a way to be able to say, ah. Correct. So there's a delegation model that has not been covered yet. No, no, but. but there's a provider decision on that. It's me asking for that. Correct. And delegating the privilege to the provider. To no, the let, let, let me tell you how I see it. The service provider requires attributes for you to get access to the service, okay? It says in its requirements policy, which gets passed through to, to the user client, this is what I want, okay? The user can be given access to that, and the user can say, well, I'm not gonna give you that, so I won't have the service. Or the user will decide, yeah, I'm happy to give those attributes, so I want the service, and then he goes and asks the IDP. Now, in my, in my opinion, an IDP should always give me my attributes. An IDP should not say, no, I'm not giving you them, because, because I have in my pocket a whole bunch of attributes from a whole bunch of different places, and I can give them to the who the hell I like. And, and if the bank says, well, you can't give your credit card to him there, well, how, how the bank can't stop me? So really, the I should be in charge of who gets my attributes. I the IDP shouldn't be saying I'm not giving them out. It, I say, I want them, they're my attributes, and I, I want them to go there for the service. So that seems a perfectly reasonable uh, model uh, in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. That's right. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's the right way, that's the right way it, sh it should be. The, us the user should decide whether he wants his attributes to go, to go or not. Well, okay, but th I mean, we talk, we're talking user interface issues, but at the, at, the, at the protocol level, there should be the full visibility. If the interface just wants to make it a tick, are you happy or not, to continue, that's an interface, level. But, but if in the protocol it actually says the policy is that I require these attributes, then the interface can say, we're gonna re you know, we are gonna release these attributes, are you happy to release all of these attributes or not? Okay.
Correct. Yeah. And so, and so in, in that case, what will happen is that you won't have in, enough attributes for authorization, so it will have to go back to the client, we'll have to go and collect them. Now, because you've done single sign-on, you shouldn't need to enter your credentials again. You, you should just click, yes, I'm happy to release them, and the system should just go and pull, pick them up and send them. Yeah? Um, and then finally, this, this is, now this is a component that doesn't exist today. Um, although talking to you, I think it was you in the, it, it does sort of exist in Keystone. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think you call it the catalog, is that right? Um, yeah, um, so what I envisage there is, is a, some sort of federation directory service where when, when OpenStack has found out from the user which IDP is chosen, it goes to the federation directory service and says, get me all the metadata and all the information I need in order to be able to make a connection to that IDP. Now, in today's federation world, certainly in the shibboleth one, all of this metadata is sent in some massive gigabyte XML file, which is distributed every couple of, I mean, it's a completely brain dead system, right? But they ship out these gigabytes of metadata every day, and you change one line in it and the whole two gigs is shipped, <laughs> you know. It's a completely naff system. What you really need is some directory service where people can update their metadata as and when, and, uh, and you can just go and act it. And, it. and it turns out, I didn't know this, but you've actually got this catalog uh, in Keystone which records the equivalent of the, the meta. It, it, it has information about the access points and, uh, and how you connect to the access point. So that's the sort of system we need. We need that built in so that, so that you can make a query of it and say, I now want to make a connection to this point. Give me all the information I need in order to create a message. And then after it's contacted the directory service, it can then go to the request issuing service and says, here's all the metadata I've got for this component from the directory service. Now you can create the message in the right protocol, et cetera. So the guiding principles in, 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 in the design is keep it simple. Yeah. Oops. Wrong, what's happening here now? Going wrong way. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it was it was it was for identity providers. Yes, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's the same concept. It's exactly the same contact. But pardon? because I, I, I assume one doesn't need to repeat what existed during the authentication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, so uh, it's really good to know you've actually got that sys component al already in there. Okay, so keep it simple for the cloud service providers. They, they, they need something external to them that does the bulk of the security work. And so that's going to be this gateway and the identity providers and all the things. It's all going to be done outside. So the people who are writing cloud services don't need to worry about it. You know, they've got good software written by skilled security professionals that have covered all the bugs, fixed all the all the problems, and it just works nicely for them. So that, that's, that's the first thing, okay? And each cloud service provider keeps its existing tenants and accounts because it knows what they are, and it knows it, knows it needs an admin role, and it knows it needs a you know, professor role or whatever, um, and, and it, trusts, it trusts the gateway to get these from external sources and do the mapping. So um, it's, because there are thousands of, of these things, it's gonna trust that the gateway will map correctly between external identity providers and the roles that it needs. So that, that's a config, so the, the, the mapping function is a configurable function that will have to be dynamically configurable. It will have to, as you set up federations, you will have to configure the attribute mapping function to map between the identity providers that you're gonna trust and the roles that your cloud service providers but because we don't want to be changing the cloud service providers. They've got their system set up, they work with a set of roles, all they're doing now is switching to external identity providers, um, but from their perspective, they just trust the gateway. They just trust Keystone or whatever to do it all for them. Is that the IBM Consulting Board's latest act of 2012? <laughs> no, in what, in what way?
Yeah, yeah well, what, 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 do, what, do, what, do, what, what do you see as the alternative? Exactly. That, that's why I don't think the standard approach works. Yeah. I mean, the other alternative is, is, is all of these customers have to go and change their systems to give that. Exactly, exactly. So, so this is the only way I see that, that, that you, can, you can do it. Um, Yeah, yeah. So it's so a proxying through and, and yeah. I mean, you, you, I mean, we, we, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. I mean, we have proxying built into the current implementation. Um, now, this is a change to, to um, what the way it works at the moment. The user knows which cloud service he wishes to use, so that's his first port of call. Now, in the current clients, the first port of call is Keystone. You type in the address of Keystone, don't you? Um, but I think, I mean, this can be discussed, but it seems in the, in normally you go to the, where you want the service, say, I want some service, and then it all starts from there. And, and that gives more flexibility because the service can say, well, I'm going to use that Keystone or that Keystone, I'm not going to use Keystone or whatever, and it can, it can tell the user where it wants the user to, to, to go to. Um, so that is a change from the, from the existing scheme. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not a big issue, that, but it, 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 it allows also, by going to the service provider first, it allows the service provider to dynamically change its, its requirements in terms of attributes as well. Yeah. That's right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, now that we've talked about the, the phishing and an and intelligent client will solve that. So, so let's look at um, the, the swim lane for the. Uh, I could do with a. I could do with a. Um, Sure. Um, the, the intelligent client performs several functions. One function it performs is it will not allow the client to be redirected to the IDP by the service provider or by Keystone. Because that is, with, when you're using username and password, it's a way that phishing attacks work in, in all of the current identity provider systems. Okay, so. The user goes to a service provider, and the service provider happens to be an evil one, but the user doesn't know that because he's been tricked into it. And the service provider says, oh, authenticate, go to your open ID, or go to Google, or go to University of Kent, or wherever. And the user sees the screen, 
and the user doesn't notice that the URL ends in .cn or .ru or something because it's gone off the end of the screen or whatever, and he just thinks he's talking to his normal identifier, and he types in his username and password, and, and, and he's fished. Okay, so the, the intelligent one, when the service provider says, I want you to authenticate with Google or wherever, he says, well, I know where Google is, or I know where the University of Kent is. I'm not going to rely on you to send me there. I will go to the directory service myself, and I'll get the information, and I'll create, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort it out myself. That, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it can create. Look, that's the first thing it does. The second thing it does. No, I'm I'm saying I'm saying that it knows it knows where the identity provider is, and it's not going to be told go there, right? That's the first thing. The second thing it does is when you've got multiple attributes for your identity from multiple providers, it will actually go and aggregate them and collect them. That's the second thing. And then the, the third thing it will do, this, the current identity systems work in what's called bearer credentials. So the identity provider creates an assertion which says, I've authenticated this user and he's got the following attributes. And this is a digitally signed assertion, which is a good digitally signed assertion. But it doesn't actually say, who the user is. It goes to the browser and the browser then sends it off to the search provider. Now that token is capturable and replayable because it's got, it's not, it's a bearer credential. Anybody who's got it can use it. And um, there's a function called holder of key where you can actually create a key pair. And the, again, another function of the, of the intelligent client is to create the key pair and to sign things so it can prove that this is my public key in there, and I'm capable of signing it, so you know that that token was made for me because I've, I've got the private key and I can prove it. Yeah. So that's the third function that, that, that it does. Okay, so um, I, as I say, I don't know if this is a... Uh, it is, I think, isn't it? I don't know where it... Where is it? Oh, there, okay. So, so the first thing is the user types in the command. So I've got an example of that from, from the live demo. Um, so the first thing you type in is, this is an example of using Swift, and you'll see there there's a minus F. So those of you who are familiar with what the Swift command looks like, which probably most of you, you'll know that there isn't normally a minus F, and you normally put a username and password in. But here, we're saying we want federated uh, login. So I'm not... I'm not telling the Swift client what my username and password is because I'm going to tell that to the identity provider. I'm just saying I want federated login, okay? And that client then sends that command to the uh, cloud service provider, and the cloud service provider sends back its policy of attributes. So it says, these are the attributes I want in order for you to uh, access me, and you have to get them from um, the gateway. So it's telling about its local attributes in terms of the gateway that's going to issue them, because the gateway is its trusted issuer. So the user is redirected to the gateway, but that's perfectly secure, because the user's not going to do anything there, and if the cloud service provider is an evil one and redirects it to an evil gateway, it still won't, it still won't break anything at this point in time. Okay, so when it gets to the gateway, right, the gateway then goes to the attribute mapper and says, this cloud service is asking for these attributes, but <coughs> we're configured up to trust external identity providers, okay, and there might be three or four or five or six, um, and can you tell me who they are? And it says, yeah, you can get the attributes from these, you can get it from Google or Facebook or University of Kent or wherever, and it then sends that to the user, uh, back to the client, and the client displays to the user w where he can go. So we call these realms in the documentation, but what comes back is you have access to the following realms. Now, these are identity providers. You can do your wording or you know, user interface however you want, but that's basically saying, to the user. You can log in via Big Bank, who's an IDP. You can either log in via your bank, 
or you can log in via the Kent Proxy Identity Service. You choose which of your identity providers do you want to use, okay? So the user chooses one. So after the user's chosen one, that goes back to OG, and OG now knows which identity provider has been chosen. So it goes to the directory service, which is the catalog, and says, give me all the meta information so that I can actually create a request to call this identity provider. So the directory service returns all the meta information, or your catalog that you've got now returns the information, and then it goes to the request issuing service and says, here's all the meta information. I don't know what protocol it talks, don't anything about it, but here's all package of stuff. Give me back a message. Give me back a request message that will request these attributes that I require in the right format of OAuth or OpenL, you know, OpenID or whatever language it is. Don't care. Just give me a blob. And it gets back a blob, and it gives the blob to the client. The client is a dumb client. doesn't need to look at the blob. It just says, here's a blob, pass it off, and it just passes the blob to the identity provider. The identity provider gets this blob in the language it knows and understands. It decodes, it checks the signature, uh, and it says, all right, uh, I need to authenticate you. Now, this bit of the protocol here, number 12, is not standardized. That's out of scope because that's the way the identity provider authenticates the user. This can be two-factor, three-factor, biometrics, PKI, Kerberos, you name it, you can have it. We don't care. Time, okay, we'll give it another 10 minutes and we'll be fine. Um, and so, looking at what that looks like. We know nobody has the full house. Sorry? Nobody so, has the full right, so we're okay then, we'll continue. Um, so that's, I chose we're big. Got a hard at eight yeah, 8 o'clock, we got 8 o'clock, yeah. Okay, um, I've got a deadline for flight, so I've got, I've got a cycle an hour before it gets dark, so. Uh, so, so that's the login screen from Big Bank, because I decided I was going to log in via Big Bank, so I, I go to Big Bank. And what's happened here now is the client has called up the browser, um, and the browser uh, has displayed its login screen, and the user knows where to put his username and where to put his password. And uh, so that's, that's the authentication bit done. Oh, something went wrong with my return there. My, obviously didn't quite get my um, screen right. Okay, so that goes back to the, um, to the IDP. And what the IDP then is, is, it sends an assertion in the protocol language, could be OAuth, could be OpenID, or whatever. It sends the assertion back to say, yep, okay, we, we've, we've authenticated this guy now, and here's his attributes. And the client passes that to the gateway, and the gateway passes it to the credential validation service, which is the pair of the request issuing service. It knows how to parse it. It knows how to validate it, and it says, okay, this is a good message. Here are all the attributes, and it can give the attributes back to the gateway. And the gateway can then go to the mapper and say, okay, I got all these attributes from this external IDP. How do they map into the local ones that the service provider wants? And, of course, it knows because it did the reverse mapping on the, on the way going out. So it gives them, it gives them the uh, attributes. And then it goes to the token issuing service to issue an unscoped token, because at this point in time, in this particular flow, we don't know which tenant, because the user didn't say which tenant he wanted. So it gets an unscoped token, and the unscoped token goes to the client, and this is what happens next. It says, you have access to the following tenants, and because I chose Big Bank, I've got access to the Visa user cloud services, so I've only got one particular tenant in this particular case, but there could have been six or whatever. Uh, and I choose which I want, so I choose my tenant, and then uh, you know what's going to happen next. The unscoped token is going to get converted into the scope token, so that goes back there to OG. It sends it to the validation service. It validates the unscoped token, and then it sends it to the issuing one, which issues the scope token, and then the scope token goes back to the user. The user, the client, sorry, the client passes it to the service, the service has now got the scope token, which it passes back to the gateway, and it sends it for validation, and then the client gets back all its attributes and everything, uh, and then it calls the PDP with the attributes and says, does the guy get access with these attributes? And of course, the answer comes back granted, and, and then he gets, the, he gets the information that he wants. And uh, next step, okay. Do you want a live demo? If you want, we'll, we can live dangerously, yeah? Okay. Let's, um, let's do a live demo then.
So. I'll tell you what then, let's do the other bits first and we'll do the live demo at the end for those who want it, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know I had to enter, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's a PKI company, for goodness sake. Oh, OpenStack and Keystone will be a PKI if they want to get it right. Um, and that is the right way to do it. Um, no, no, it isn't, because, because PKI gives you nothing except it tells you that the guy's been authenticated. It doesn't no, tell you anything about his privileges not and permissions. Not at all. X.509 is extensible. You can put what you can well, put you, Yeah, if you use attribute in certificates, in yeah. Their, cert yeah. their age, their mother's maiden name, you can put whatever. Yeah, but you don't. You do not load PKI certificates up with all these attributes. You use attribute certificates exactly for that. Exactly right. The right. attribute certificates. So right. all identity tokens, SAML, passport Yeah, yeah. They're all based on X.509 attribute certificates, I know. The, the actually, uh, not to my knowledge, anyway. Well, well they are, because the, the people who wrote SAML said, told me that it was based on X509 attributes. SAML, yes. Passport yeah. cookies, no. NT tokens and uh, yeah. Kerberos tokens, no. No, okay. So there are a bunch of tokens which are authentication tokens which give some base mm -hmm. identity information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And potentially a couple of base attributes which are sufficient for certain kinds of authorization but not others. Well, certainly for access but control lists, an ID sure. is sufficient. But, but the yeah. point I'm really making yeah. uh, is, and, and, and uh, this might not be even the forum, uh, and uh, I just want to know if you've thought about it. Identrus failed in large part. I know because I was there and I, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, and I uh, hold some accountability uh, for, for it. It failed because the banks were unwilling to make assertions about their customers to any third party for right. liability reasons. Right. Banks have this uh, interesting property that when they undertake any risk, they have to set money aside. It's called capitalization, and they hate it. They don't like setting money aside. It's unproductive money. They want to lend it out and get interest on it, right? So um, same thing happened in passport. I see if you're for passport also. You, you seem to have a history. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, well, uh, okay, so what are you in now then? What should we avoid? Uh, Keystone. No. <laughs> <laughs> no uh, here's the deal, right? I mean, businesses do things if they think they're going to make money. Correct. correct. So, federation, so, so the travel industry is a federation. Hertz is willing to federate with. Uh, Marriott or Delta Airlines because it's a customer uh, referral I, I, system. I know, I understand, yeah, exactly I understand. Exactly right. Yeah. Uh, nobody signs up and says, hey, come one, come all. If you want to know somebody's age, I'll tell you. They don't do that. No, no, I understand that, I understand that. So, uh, no, okay, I mean, well, I mean I, I, my only question was, have you thought about uh, who will be the IDPs who will provide rich attributes that are typically used in businesses? like purchasing limits, uh, like whether or not you're allowed to edit grades for students, so things like that. Well, <laughs> ah, yes, uh, they, we, the, so thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very good with the uh, plan that, hey, we're implementing a solution of which the technology layer has been thought through, and the business layer is up to the business people. Maybe it'll work. Um, I personally uh, hesitate to get into it.
issues that you're bringing up is that a lot of um, service providers, you know, they collect a lot of personal information about us already, and I have no idea that, you know, who they're sharing my, you know, business information, my age, you know, uh, yeah, right. So there's a lot of policy issues there about how this stuff is going to be managed that just isn't there yet. So um, I actually wanted to take this discussion in a slightly different direction in that, um, you know, what David has proposed is a completely general solution to the sort of federated identity management and into the federated resource um, management um, discussion. Now, in terms of use cases that would drive what is really needed here, uh, I would think that there are many different situations and use cases where you could get by with something that is uh, somewhat de-scoped. It doesn't have everything in here that is described because this is the completely general solution. For the 60 or 70 or 80 percent solution that would address a lot of markets, you know, where could we make this simpler mm. Mm. And, mm. and maybe prioritize which mm. bits that we, that we bite off and work through some of these policy issues mm. about mm. how you actually manage the distribution of your, that, of your attributes and so forth. I mean, I have my own, you know, you know, reasons for being here, but I wanted to get a notion from the rest of the room, you know, what's important to, uh, about, uh, you know, federated clouds. And oh, one the last point is that um, in the NIST federal <coughs> cloud strategy document, you know, they have the volume one that has, you know, the 10 recommendations for, uh, you know, cloud adoption. And number five is, is cloud federation. Okay, so there's, a, you know, there is distinct uh, interest to, to address, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, so a little bit of history. Uh, a couple months ago, I wrote a blueprint called Federation, and uh, next time I checked on it, there were a couple paragraphs at the end, at the bottom by this gentleman from the University of Kent. And so of course, what's the first thing I did? I went to Google and I said, okay, this guy kind of knows something about security. This is not out of the blue. Um, and we started battling back and forth. So one of the first things that I realized is what I was calling Federation was a subset of it that um, kind of came to what we're calling delegation now. And so one of the use cases there is to, um, the HP has a, a cloud offering and they don't want to have to manage each individual user, each individual group from the people who are purchasing space in their cloud. So it's gonna be a very deliberate <coughs> uh, setup between two organizations, a cloud provider, a public cloud provider say, and an uh, organization that's to use space there and for them to be able to do that. So I could see, for instance, um, the role of the mapper being done by the, the current LDAP uh, mechanisms, we, assuming that we get them so that they actually work in the generic case. You run your own Keystone service in your company and send a, t a token on forward. So in that case, you have abstracted, you've taken this abstraction you've done there and done it completely within the realm of, of uh, Keystone, where Keystone is now playing the job of the mapper take your LDAP schema and get it into what I call roles in, in service catalog and let me send that on to the centralized, when I say centralized, the one running at HP. So we know that the idea of being able to push down to the end organizations, the ability to manage their own users is some, something that's in demand, okay? Um, and it may be that it's within a, even within a side, inside a uh, single cloud. Um, you know, take the DOD case, it may be that the DOD runs a single cloud, but Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines each have their own individual systems that they manage themselves, but they have to be able to access each other's resources. Um, so this is a great, I think this is a, probably the most important thing in this, I say, is what I would call pattern language. So we, we have a way that we can discuss it. We know how the general concepts here map to Keystone. You know, and that's why uh, Joe and I have been asking these things, you know, how do these things map to what we really have here? Because we do need to apply to a real problem domain, right? And it's not gonna be your Facebook, but we do know that there are identity management systems out there. Um, and probably LDAP and Active Directory is the number one. If we solve it for that, we're, we, we, we've, we've probably got it down. And I mean, I mean what, what, I would like to, what I would like to push for is clearly defined interfaces within Keystone. So you've got the functionality, but it's right. maybe spaghettily you know, linked in. Make a clean interface, use your existing code then that exists. It may have reduced functionality, but it doesn't matter, because once you've got a clean interface, guys can innovate and they can rip out and put in sophisticated, much more general purpose ones. But 
let, if we don't have the interfaces and we don't have the concepts and the functionality, you've just got a big blob of you know, spaghetti that you can't do anything with. So that, that's what I'd be asking for. Make it simple. Make the first implementation simple. Ma you know, you might, might not have a directory service. In fact, we've implemented a directory service, but, but only via the interface. What it actually does is it gets the UK Access Management Federation two gigabits of, you know, blooming metadata and just stores it in a file and then just skims through it and scans through and picks up the information and returns. It's a completely naff implementation, but it's got the functionality that's needed. I mean, what we'd like to do is have it as a sophisticated LDAP directory service and store all the schemas in there, it, 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 you know, in future. But, but at least the interface is there and it, it provides the functionality you yeah, need. So the, the functional decomposition, um, as described here, has actually already started. We're already starting to do this. You know, yeah. the token issuing service is one of the things with the PKI tokens, we're talking about being able to push down the ability to sign a token to some other service. And um, the, one of the primary use cases driving this is um, Horizon needs to be able to take these secure authentication mechanisms such as Kerberos, PKI, and um, it can't pass that on through to, to Keystone, right? It, it, you, you can't say, okay, um, here's, the, uh, here's the, the private key that, that this guy's using. Is, is this valid? You, you don't do that in, in PKI. It, it, you know, if you do client certificate authentication, it has to be done between the web server that you're calling and the, uh, and the, the client's browser. Um, so we're going to say, well, if you, since you're doing that validation, you, you sign a token. And then you can send that token over to Keystone and go, that might, again, go from an unscoped to a scoped token. Um, we also say, okay, well, why don't we say every, say we have three Horizon servers, give them separate certificates so we can invalidate them separately. At that point, it says, yeah, let, let me, let, that way I only have to invalidate the tokens for the one that gets violated um, you know, when, the, when those attacks happen. So we're already starting that functional decomposition there. The credential validation policy, that's off token middleware. Um, uh, the, th that's why the, the, the conversation is really centered around the ones that were less clear is what they meant. And, and, and uh, I forget what our IS stood for. Re request issuing service. The re that's the one that creates the, that creates the request to the identity provider. Yeah. And that's the one that frightens me. You know, that's the one that, yes, I know if it's, um, if it's Horizon or if it's um, um, Python Keystone client that we can do correctly. Um, well, that's, that's all you need to do. End of there. As long as you've got a clean interface, just do it and leave it at that. Right. And some other guys like us will come along and say, well, here's the SAML one. Right, exactly. So getting yeah. that such that you know, other people get it right, <coughs> we should be able to do, do the whole thing such that they can't get it wrong. They can just get yeah. it so that it doesn't They can't get it so that they violate it. They can just get it so that it doesn't they, work. It I mean, yeah, work exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you just deny access, so that's secure. Yeah, so the, 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 the push towards federation was already happening um, from a purely extend the OpenStack mechanism, the Keystone mechanisms, um, to make it work. And w when I found out about this effort, which had obviously been underway for a little bit of time, since I think you presented on this a year ago, um, the, uh, the yeah, eucalyptus one. So they, they, they met them at, uh, Exactly. So, so, you know, so we're on to, on to um, how do we incorporate this into, but, you know, at the moment what I've got is Word documents and PowerPoint slides and we've got a complete disconnect between the way you work and the way I'm used to working. And so my stuff is not getting distributed to you because A, I don't even know how to do it. I mean, I've got, I've got a learning curve to learn how to even make my documents available. Right. Yeah, yeah, but you know, so, so there are some basic, simple things that I need to do in the next month or so to get this stuff to you to get feedback and comment. Adam kindly took my initial design document and turned that into the right format as a, as a blueprint, but I need to, you know, get myself genned up to do this. And uh, I've got these PowerPoint pictures and, and swim lanes. How do I get those swim lanes uh, so that people can see them and, and comment on them? So there's, you know, stuff like that. Um, and we've actually got the code, so the code exists. How do we get the code to you um, so that you can actually start to use it and play with it and test it and, and uh, you know, create a new branch and quality assure it, etc. So there are a, a number of practical steps we'd like to do in the next few hours, days, weeks, you know, as soon as possible, really. <laughs> um, Let me answer that last one. Yeah.
Yeah. And the gear is our, uh, for example, the gear we had our most awesome system. Yeah. Even before our committee passes for review, we just need the whole end to end system, including all of the individual commits. So if okay. you some other revision in the full system, I would highly recommend that you stay using CVS. Yeah, well, I mean, we're using SVN and, and CVS at the moment, yeah. So but, there uh, are tools that convert to SVN to get you that locally, and it's right. exactly what we call that. So not only do we see the end state, we saw it in the topic. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'll get I'll get my researcher to to, to, to start on that then. Yeah. When, when next. Yeah. If if he can do, yeah, yeah. Um, so that that that's that's good. Um, and also, we'd like to get some feedback testing. You know, people who try it out and test it and, and tell us. But we know there are some problems at the moment. We've we've got one problem at the moment which we haven't solved with some of the identity providers with the. When we actually call up the browser, the browser sends the request, then the user authenticates, and then it sends the response back. Now we tell the identity provider to send it to local host, and then the client software picks up the response from local host, and then sends it to Keystone. There are a couple of identity providers will not send the response to local host. We don't know why at the moment, we don't know what's actually causing the problem. Google's okay, that works, OpenID works, but Facebook doesn't work, it will not send, I mean, you might not be interested in Facebook anyway, but um, it, it won't actually send the response. Even though they know it's us, and we've registered with them, we're trusted, and we're a trusted um, service provider to them. Well, the... Yeah, well, yeah, so, so we, we, that's right, that's right, we, yeah, it, it's a, re and so it comes into local host, but some of them, some of, the, the thing, the thing is that in, certainly in the shibboleth and the, um, the academic world where, in that federation, they require the address they published in the metadata. So you, you have to actually, the identity provider, um, sorry, the service provider has to publish the address that it wants it to come back to. So it, it has to be fixed in metadata. So we've published, fixed it as, as local host. And that, um, so, so that's one of the restrictions that you can't dynamically change it either. So, yeah. Well, no, only, it's just going to send it to Keystone, that's all. But we've got to somehow get it from the browser to the client to send it to Keystone. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. Well, we'll, we'll have to talk about this offline then and, and see. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, that might be the solution then. Yeah. I know that's a bug with, that's a current bug in the current implementation with some of the, um, Identity providers, they, 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 they don't like local host. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. No. no, no.